All right. Um, after much debate, I've decided to abandon the work poems um, readings. I'll try re reading something else. Um, I'm going to read or try to start reading uh, from a novel I wrote in 2007 called Dallas Pimento. And I'm reading this from my old blog um, when I went under the name Toskabode. So, let's uh, start. This is, I'm just going to read straight from this until we reach a certain point. Dallas Pimento, a novel in four volumes. This is the novel that I spent 2007 writing. Dallas Pimento, book one. Bronco, part one. I am a painter. No, I don't paint in oils. I paint with acrylics. And as if that wasn't bad enough in the eyes of many of you, I also paint with the cheapest of acrylic paints, the budget line from Dick Blick, those formulated for beginners. I build my own canvases, not with the expensive stretchers from the artist supply store, but with two by twos. They're crooked, claims my wife of the finished product. I don't think they are, and if they are, they certainly aren't so crooked as to make them unviable as art. Hell, in this world where a man can package his own shit and call it marketable, or some anonymous jerk can paint stripes on lampshades and get accepted in an art contest that refused a lovely painting by me of two old guys on a bench, I hardly think it much matters what I do, especially since no one is paying me. I work for myself, so I guess I'm self-employed to that extent. To put food on the table, however, I have to work at a little rat hole called the United States Postal Service. You may have heard of it. Without patrons, the lottery remains my only hope. My name is Dallas Pimento. I am a painter. But as you can tell from these words, I am also a writer. That's a sideline, though. Something to do during my lunch and breaks at the post office so I don't feel like the time spent there was a total waste. I could draw, and I do sometimes, but as a teenager, it had been my avowed goal to be a writer. So to satisfy that part of me, as well as the hopes and injunctions of a dozen English teachers over the years, I write. Besides, I can't draw worth a damn. When I do draw, I draw crappy cartoons, and that's another source of frustration and guilt. I draw single panel things, totally random. I don't draw what they call sequential art, that is, multi-panel comic strips or graphic novels. Hey man, are you writing a comic book? Somebody asked me here at the post office. That's where I am as I write this. Irritating me, not just because he spoke to me, that's bad enough, but also because this guy brought up this great failure of mine, the failure to draw a comic book or graphic novel. I have failed to learn the saxophone and to speak German, Japanese, and French as well. These are all galling to me. I don't want all of this to give you the wrong impression about me. I'm not unhappy or discontented. It's just that I am motivated to a great degree by guilt. You can throw in fear, too. Fear of having wasted my life and potential. Fear of other people looking down at me as a nobody who never did a damn thing. At least I've settled that question. I have done a great deal. I'm proud of my paintings. I'm proud of the fact that I've written several books, if not all that proud of the books themselves. They're fairly disjointed and inconsistent. No plot, not much in the way of anything to express, hundreds of thin characters thrown up left and right like faces on a crowded sidewalk. So here you have me in writer mode, even though I am a painter. This book was begun on my first day back at work after two and a half weeks off. I'm getting old. Just that little amount of time away from the grind of my strength and endurance dissipate to the point where I'm weak and tired. It remains now for me to write. Much as I would like to fuse painting and writing, it doesn't seem to be possible. That would be moot if I could paint at work, but I can't. But Dallas, I seem to hear you saying, drawing is a form of painting, why not draw? Would that that was true. The far, farther along I get in my painting career, the more I do see the truth that drawing is or should be the foundation of painting, but I also see just how divergent the two are. In painting, one can overcome one's limitations as a draftsman by covering over one's mistakes. That's not possible in drawing. But you don't want to hear about something that you can't see, do you? You want to read, them, you want to read something diverting. I'll try to oblige while also pleasing myself. An elfin runaway, his hands scorned by the ladder he used to descend from the tower at the back of the scene before us, has little to do with anything, I suppose, yet as much as anything else does in this absurd world. 
My adventurers may come into the following arrangement, but so may any damn thing at all, so be forewarned. I can see all of this collapsing into the same kind of messy collection that litters my juvenilia. That's okay. Remember, I'm writing this primarily to please myself. Fuck it. I can't shake the feeling that I'm just wasting time. Wouldn't it be more productive for me to be drawing crazy little cartoons? But then if I do that, then in the morning as I head for the house, I'll feel guilty because I didn't write anything. The Recycling Dolphin Trash, a basic pleasure model, had in her keeping a locket inside of which was a scrap of paper. Look, she told Crimsono, forcing the lock open, the locket open with a thumbnail. I don't know what it means, but I've had it a long time. The man, Crimsono, devil may care in his black jeans with the silver studs evenly spaced at the outside seams of the legs and the red roses embroidered on the sexy backside pockets, gestured for the female to wait a damn minute. Let me take off this sweater, he begged. The sweater was gold and green, with black music symbols dotting the chest. Under the sweater, he wore a simple white undershirt stained orange around the inside collar. He was ambivalent about the possibility of trash catching sight of the stain. I hope you truly understand what ambivalent means. It doesn't mean indifferent. It means essentially having two divergent, if not opposing, views about something. If you didn't already know that, forgive me for being so pedantic. If you did, then you can probably guess what Crimsono's two views were. Crimsono threw the sweater atop a couple of small pillows jammed into the right-hand corner of the sofa and made a whew noise sound with his mouth. It was a little warm in Tresh's grandmother's house. If he had had any authority at all with Tresh, he would have insisted that the heat be turned down, explaining his demand on the grounds of the Earth's dying ability to sustain such human luxury. Given his lack of authority, it was curious why Tresh should care about him seeing the long-hidden scrap of paper. How long have you had this? Crimsono asked. He's examined the paper and the curious message written thereon. Tresh, eager to explore to her advantage now that she had the man's attention, launched into an account of the passage of the locket from her great aunt L- Lydia to herself. As she spoke, Crimsono, only half listening, studied the thick lined symbol that followed the brief text of the message. Where had he seen a symbol like that before? he asked himself. Such was the distracting nature of Tresh's babble that he nearly rejected out of hand the idea that the symbol looked very similar to that used by Sleeping Porch, that great Canadian band. How silly it would be if it was really intended to be the sigil of Sleeping Porch. He suddenly held up a tawny, muscular hand, evenly adorned with thin brown hairs, interrupting Tresh's cascade of subtly linked episodes. Hold it! He cried with a wrinkling of his heavy brows. I think this is the symbol for Sleeping Porch. What Sleeping Porch? Tresh thereby revealed her ignorance, as if her Dacron Three Little Pigs t-shirt and green plastic sandals were not proof enough. They're a band, Crimsono summed up. He could have gone into detail, but then Tresh's mind would have wandered over a thousand non-musical items as he spoke, resulting in nothing more than wasted effort on his his part. Still, he longed to tell her of their power and majesty, of their long and incident-crowded history. Formed from the ruins of two minor early 70s bands, The Tempters and Flaming Yawn, Sleeping Horch had produced 22 albums over the years though fans of Crimsono's caliber were inclined to discount the last four or five as they came after a period of confusion during which a distressing number of the original members left, left and returned and left again. The pall of illegitimacy now hung over all. Jack Flame, the current lead guitarist, who had replaced the replacement for the original guitarist, Ned Nash, was a source of particular contempt for a hardcore fan like Crimsono. Another person who hated what had happened to the band, if not Flame himself, was Wrenchless, a man more nearly equal in age to Nash than Crimsono, living in a house only 300 yards away from Tresh's grandmother's house. A Monopoly of Beefs Wrenchless had seen something large, colored gray and pink, it seemed, moving through the thick stand of trees that separated his backyard from the backyard of Katnia, otherwise known as Tresh's grandmother. He squinted at the thing, trying to get it straight in his mind, but it was suddenly gone. He put down the 200-year-old pistol he had been cleaning and opened the sliding glass door that led outside. On Rensselaer's concrete back porch was a ceramic frog about a foot tall. It wore a close-fitting sweater of black and brown, a white zigzagging line running about its middle. It thrilled to the familiar touch of the white cat that approached after Rensselaer had descended from the porch to the backyard. 
Where do you suppose he's off to? She asked the frog as she put her hand on his shoulders from behind and leaned her head against his. Who cares? The frog rhetorically admitted his indifference. Well, I do, or I wouldn't have asked. The cat, at one time well known in the local, in the local community for her left-wing views and her activism, was still sleepy from the unaccustomed activity of the night before. A troop of itinerant thespians had put on a performance down at the small, so-called Buddhist pavilion next to the creek in the midst of the stand of trees. The cat had been there, enjoying every detail of it, and wishing that she could go with them when they moved on. To fight this desire, she had ran away after the final scene and forced herself to miss the sight of the troop's wagon slowly rolling down the road. Puncho, the leader of the troop, aboard redneck accents. That is probably why he did them so well. His reading of the redneck character was such that he felt free to insult them as much as possible, knowing that none would take offense, either because no true redneck, that is, one proud to be a redneck and proud of having all the qualities associated with the appellation, would attend a performance, or because even should one somehow be present, so thoroughly authentic would be Punchlow's characterization that the redneck in question would know, would not realize that his stereotype was being mocked. As the wagon rolled along, Puncho wondered if any one among the previous night's audience had been a redneck. He supposed not. From what he could tell, they seemed a refined, if provincial, lot. Of course, he usually didn't mingle with the locals. Although he disapproved, thinking that it somehow sullied the purity of the art and the craft, he said nothing about those in the troop who did enjoy meeting new people. What's the point? Puncho asked himself. You're never going to see any of them again. In fact, Puncho felt a horror at the idea of running into dimly remembered acquaintances. What if he should not come across as the same fellow they had met before? He assumed a redneck accent for the benefit of the horse that pulled the wagon and whose reins he held in his hands. Why, you're nothing like what I thought you were, he said. He's talking to himself again, Wyla, who specialized in evil woman roles, announced to her card-playing colleagues. The pavilion by the creek was called the Buddhist pavilion because of its vaguely oriental or exotic design. It's also very restful, explained Cottony to a friend near, nearby, oh, to a friend nearly as decrepit in appearance as herself. It wasn't very rest, restful for the Anderson boy, replied the friend. Didn't they find him murdered there a couple of years ago? Well, yes, admitted Cottony, but now he is at rest. Old fool, thought Cottony's friend. No wonder they've confiscated your house and put you here in the loony bin. Now, if it had been Glenda, the friend in question, with a house that nice at stake and still functioning legs, she would have put up more of a fight. She would have barricaded herself indoors with a gun, perhaps Harold's, her late husband, service revolver. That used to be something of a cliché, the service revolver, oftentimes the only gun in the house, the only gun available to some decent middle-class law-abiding family. Asa, where are you going with your old service revolver? Just to the secret meeting, Mary. Nothing to worry about. He checks the cylinder. Keep the doors bolted. All right, if I can remember, I will do this. I'll take up where I left off next time. Bye-bye.